We have two exercises for yesterday. So one, remember, was uh, we take uh, L1, 0, 1, and we take the function that I have <coughs> in, denoted by L of x. So we know that uh, the norm of L is equal 1. So this is a linear bounded operator. And uh, we want, so, and we take now an element x in E. And we assume that uh, the norm of x in L1, of course, is equal to 1. And we want to show that it is not possible that uh, uh, L of x, uh, I mean, we want to show that this is not a max. This is the definition. And we want to show that this is not a, a max. So assume it is a max. So assume that. I mean, assume that there is a, a function x with this, uh, satisfying this. So x is not identically 0, in particular, is not identically 0. So there is uh, some delta. So x is not identically 0. And, and therefore, there is some positive delta. say delta less than 1, such that the integral from 0 to delta of x is uh, some positive number. Okay, so let me assume it is called, let me call it maybe alpha, alpha. Okay. Now, so starting from this equality, we now split, uh, sorry, this is, uh, yeah. so assume that L of x is equal to 1. So assume that 1 is equal to the integral from 0 to 1 of s of t, x of t. Okay. So this is less than or equal than the integral from zero to delta, okay, t x of t plus the integral from the delta to one t x of t. So we split uh, uh, the integral in between 0 and 1, between 0 delta and delta, and delta 1. And then, and then here t is less than delta. So this is less than <coughs> delta. So delta times the integral from 0 to delta. So this way, we want, uh, we we, the, the, this is the trick to, to forget about uh, the multiplication by this factor here. So in this way, there is no prefactor here. And also here, t is less than 1. So also in this, in this way, we are now without the multiplication by t. So this is very similar to the L1 norm, right? So this is equal to delta integral from 0 to delta x of t dt plus integral from 0 to 1 minus integral from 0 to delta t So in this way, we now have the absolute value of x, but mm, 
more importantly, there is no more any more uh, there is no any more uh, multiplication by t here. Okay, so one is equal to that. So this is equal to the integral from zero to one x of t dt uh, plus <coughs> plus. Delta minus one. Delta minus uh, one times thank you. Times alpha exactly. Hmm? Okay, so so one is equal to this. And therefore finally the L1 norm of x cannot be equal to 1, cannot be equal to 1, because if it is 1, then, I mean, uh, 1 plus 1 minus delta alpha. So the, the, this says that if I have an element x such that L of x is equal to 1, hmm, then it is impossible to have that this is equal to, to 1. Okay. So the proof runs as follows. Assume that L of x is equal to 1. Hmm? So we have this. And so necessarily the norm of x is larger than 1. Because uh, delta is less than 1, you see. Okay. And alpha is positive. OK, so this, is, this cannot be true. This so this so, so uh, x cannot be one. So so we have shown that L of x say equal to one implies x larger than one. So this shows that this is not a max, as we said yesterday. <clears throat> so the idea essentially is to, somewhat, to find a way to remove the multiplication by t. You see, there is no more t here. So that is. Seem very similar to L, the L1 norm, actually. It is the L1 norm plus something. <coughs> so this is, OK. Then <coughs> uh, the, the other exercise was, I think it was this one. Yes, it was. So I, I have the span of E1 en, etc. So remember, any element here is a finite sum, finite combination, finite linear combination of this. We will consider this uh, with the, uh, endowed with the L1 norm. So we look, we see this inside L1 with the induced norm. So the, uh, we want, so now we take uh, the G. Uh, G was span of E1. So it was R E1. And we have the, the functional G of lambda E1 equal lambda. I think that is where my notation, I hope. So uh, this is a linear function on a subspace, so this is a subspace of E. This is a linear, uh, linear, uh, linear, and also it is bounded because we can compute the norm of G 
And so the norm of G is clearly 1. OK? Is this clear? Hmm? The norm of G is equal 1. Is the supremum of this among lambda less than 1? Hmm. This is the supremum. Uh, just one minute. So this is just one. Uh, this is just. Let, let me call this maybe G zero, G zero, or G one, G one. Okay. So this is just uh, a linear map on a subspace, a linear functional on a subspace of E. Now we want to show that it can be extended in several different ways. There are several. I think, uh, the No, I mean, the norm is, these are, these are always 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0. I see. I thought so, no, no, this is the, sorry, these are the usual notation that we have used in the course. I mean, this is 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, et cetera, et cetera. These are the, okay? Uh, so the notation is the following. EI equal 0, 1, 0, et cetera. This is in the height position. Okay. So now I was saying that this is the supremum of G lambda E1 such that lambda is less than 1, and therefore this is equal to 1. So now uh, we, we, we um, so fix uh, J in between uh, 1, 2, in n, say, without, uh, without 0, j bigger or equal than 1. And define, so for instance, j equal to 2 if you want, and then define the following, uh, the following, my notation is this, I think, uh, yes. Define the following object. So this is equal 1 if i is in n and i or 0. For instance, take f2 just to. So F2 with J equal to 2, so is equal so F2 of A1 is equal 1 because I is in uh, 1 because I is equal 1. F2 of E2 is equal 1. Okay, because J is equal 2 now, as an example. And F2 of E i is equal to 0 if i is bigger than 2. OK, for, this is just an example. Is it clear? But for any j, we have fj, hmm? for instance, f2. Now we have to make it linear. So we extend linearly this fj. on E. So let me denote it yet by Fj, maybe. So uh, Fj is the same symbol for the um, linear extension on, of Fj on E. Use, I am using the same symbol, OK? J. Still denote by, let us still denote. the node by fj, the linear extension of fj on This means that if I take a finite combination of uh, e1, e2, et etc., et cetera, then I use the obvious, the obvious way to extend it, OK? For instance, uh, uh, say f2 
of lambda e1 pu plus mu 2 is just, by definition of the linear extension, just, just an example, lambda f2 e1 plus mu f2 e2. Uh, and uh, by that example, this is simply lambda plus mu as an example. So this is an example, for instance, for instance. OK. Remark. <coughs> Any fj extend g. For any j we have that fj is equal to g on g1 on the domain of g. Okay. Uh, any fj is equal to g, any F, fj is linear by definition. So I have found for the moment infinitely many linear functionals extending g. For the moment, is it okay for the moment? Now what we have to show that, uh, what about the norm now? So I claim that not only this, I will show that the, each fj is continuous and norm preserving. So I claim that uh, actually this is equal to the norm of g, which is equal to 1. OK? So this means that if this is true, of course, any fj has finite norm, so it is bounded, not only bounded, but, yeah? Sorry? For any j, g1? Ah, g1. This is, sorry, it was a notation. It's just the, the domain g, g, OK, sorry, g. G or G1, I don't remember. G. G. G1. Uh, because at some moment I have written G1. Yes. Yesterday was G, sorry. Yesterday was G, so also today is G, not G1. Sorry, G. Okay. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so if this is true, this means that there is, there is, a, there are, there is an infinitely that there are infinitely many linear continuous maps keeping the norm, preserving the norm of G, and extending G. So this, if it is true, means, of course, that in the Hambanak version of the extension theorem, we cannot expect uniqueness in general. OK? So. What do we have to do? We have to compute the supremum of, so we, we have to compute the supremum. So this is, the, by definition, is the supremum of fj, uh, let me call it uh, x, divided by the norm of x, such that x is in the span the span was E, maybe. I don't remember. E. OK. We have to compute this. So what is x? x, so take a finite, so take uh, a finite set of indices. Uh, 
set of indices. And so we have to compute fj of the sum uh, e into e and i i divided by the norm of the sum and i Okay, so take a finite set of indices, take numbers lambda i, not all equal to zero. So that this element, this is x, so that this x is non zero. Hmm? So the, I, we have to compute this. So this is, this is, I mean, this is f of x divided by x for where x this so this is x hmm. remember that uh, the, 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 the the important point here is that what is a linear span it is finite linear combinations eh? so this is finite sum not infinite sum it's a finite sum finite linear combination so now we have to compute the, this, this denominator and the, the numerator. So what, what is the, the denominator? Is the sum is the sum of absolute values of lambda i? Do you agree? Why? Because uh, this is the L1 norm. So we are using the, the small L1 norm on E. So remember that we are looking at E as contained in L1. So the small L1 norm is just the sum of the absolute value of the components. OK, do you remember? It's just the So if you have, say, uh, lambda 1, E1, plus lambda 2, E2, say, plus lambda 3, E3. For the i, for the e i, yeah, this, this is, no, this is lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3, 0, 0, 0. OK? In components in coordinates. Do you agree? Because this is one at the first position, this is one only in the second position, this is one only in the third position. So lambda one in the first, lambda two in the second, lambda three in the third, and, and okay? It's okay? And, and the L1 norm is just the sum of the absolute value of the components, which is, which is written here, okay? Now we have to see what happens here. So we have to, to look at J. Now, if uh, this can be various things, depending on the relations between J and capital E. Uh, OK, if capital E contains, contains uh, J, uh, if capital, e if capital E contains J and 1, I would say, huh? okay, then this is just what? Absolute value of, of what? Of lambda 1 plus lambda J. Huh? Do you agree? Because the, by, by definition, this is the linear span. And, and, and here, however, I have this uh, lambda 1 absolute value plus lambda j absolute value. So this is surely less than or equal than 1. OK? And then also the other cases, it is the same. I mean, if only one of these two 
belongs to this and the other does not belong, then still this, this is less than one, less or equal than one. And if none of this belongs to this, still this is always less than or equal than one. So in any case, uh, we always have that this quotient is less than or equal than one, and therefore this is less than or equal than one. Okay? But it is also equal one because it extends the functional with linear no with norm equal one. Therefore, its norm is surely larger than the norm of G, and the norm of G is one. So it is at the same time less than or equal than one, and surely larger or equal than one. And therefore, it is one. Okay. Uh, I think that we have to make maybe the proof of Van Banak. Uh, yes. So no uniqueness of the extension. This is clear, however. You really don't need infinite dimensions to do this. Eh? There is another corollary, sorry. Before doing the proof, there is another corollary of Van Banach. So the, the third corollary, corollary. So assume that E is a normed vector space and take X in E. Then the norm of X is the supremum of uh, yes, f x such that such that which is also a max. So um, remember, if we want to write the norm of a linear operator, then the norm of a linear operator is defined as a supremum. Um, so if I want to, to write the norm of a linear operator, then I take the, the supremum of all possible uh, scalar product between uh, between the, the in Hilbert setting. I mean, uh, in Hilbert setting. Remember, in Hilbert setting. If I have a linear operator, then there is the Ritz uh, mapping so that we have in Hilbert, we have this representation. Hmm. Okay. And therefore, the norm of the linear operator are not, are not is the, mac, uh, the, the, yes, the maximum of all possible scalar product between the representing vector H0 and H as H runs in the boundary of the, in, in the unit ball. Okay? So this means that uh, essentially I'm taking this, the, the, so if I have found uh, the representing vector H0 
Then I multiply it against any h in finite dimension in the boundary of the unit ball. And then, and then I take the h which maximizes this color product. Essentially, h would be, say, parallel to x naught, essentially, to h naught. Now, here the sort of uh, converse. If I want to find the norm of a vector now, this norm of a vector can be computed as a supremum. And now the supremum, however, is against all covectors, say, uh, say against all, all linear um, functions with norm equal to 1. So it's exactly sort of a dual version of. Uh, the norm. So if you want to compute the norm of a linear operator, then you have the supremum. And here you divide by x. And here you have x is varying. Now you want to find, on the other hand, the norm of a vector. Then your supremum now is over f in the unit ball. f is varying. So just a dual, exactly dual. Uh, and this is a maximum also in this case. So there is some gain here. So in general, we have seen that if you want to compute the norm of a linear operator, this, this is a sup and not necessarily a max. But now if we, if we do this step, in this step, this sup becomes magically a max. So there is, it's not completely symmetric, the situation, right? It is in finite dimension, but in infinite dimension, it is not. So we gain something here. This is, a, this is attained. The previous exercise shows that, in general, for a linear operator, this is not attained. But for, in this case, OK? <clears throat> now, well, fx is always less than, by definition, of the norm of dual norm. By definition of norm of a linear operator, this is always less than or equal than x, than f times x. Uh, this, so, it, and therefore, if, if uh, f is non zero, then I have that uh, this is always less than x. So, this shows, passing to the supremum, uh, that at least. Uh, uh, we have that this supremum is always less than or equal than this, OK? Hmm? Is it OK? No. Uh, so let me repeat it. OK, so let I repeat it. Uh, for any f, Zero, we, we know that uh, we have this. Is this OK? Is this OK? OK. By, this is simply by the definition of uh, norm of f. If you look at the norm, this is a supremum of this, and therefore this is immediate. So once you have this, if there is, this is non zero, you can divide. Okay. Hence, passing now, this is true for any f. The right hand side does not depend on f. So, taking the supremum, huh? this immediately implies that the supremum huh? is less than x. Okay? Therefore, as I said, we have, we have not shown this equality, but just for the moment, uh, this. Now, so now, given x, uh, one of the corollaries, maybe cor now, 
corollary uh, 2. Yes, let me write down corollary 2 here. Was that, that uh, I think it was this. Uh, I don't remember the notation, please help me. So given x naught into E, there exists not necessarily unique, <coughs> but there exists such that, I don't remember the notation, but it was such that something like this. Huh? So, so now we take advantage of this. This was corollary 2 of Ambanak. Eh? So, now, so now we have given x. We apply corollary 2. So there is some f0 uh, such that such that, that. So such that x is equal to f0 into a star, such that. And then f0 x is equal to um, the product x f0. Now the point is that I want to use uh, I want to use this f naught in order to show this inequality. I we want to show this, this inequality now. So let me let me, so I want to take the maximizer essentially. So and the maximizer here is exactly essentially is f naught. Not quite because it does not satisfy the constraint. So uh, oh, well, let me write it, for instance. This, this, this we know, another way to write it is fx such that norm of f is less than 1, OK? Now, uh, I want to insert here f0. Can I? I'm not sure because I don't know. I do not control the norm. So uh, this is this is a, this F not is the max candidate one of the maximizers. I want to use F not to show that this supremum is larger than F not uh, scalar product with x, but F not does not satisfy this. So now I, I force it to satisfy. So I take another a parallel linear function parallel to F not with the with satisfying the correct constraint. So I just scale F not. So I take, say, f1, just a multiple of f0. I go parallel to f0. So this is just f0. I want it to have norm equal to 1. And therefore, I divide it by its norm, simply. So remember, x is given. And so I simply divide by this. Hmm? So this is parallel to f0 because it's a number times f0. And the norm of f1 is by this, uh, is, is 1. Is clear? Hmm? OK. Now f1 finally is in the constraint. So now F, F1 is inside the unit ball. Um, OK, so let me compute the F1 x. Let, now F1 x is equal to uh, F0 naught, F naught, uh, x divided by the norm of x. And f0 x is, uh, is uh, 
So this is simply equal to x, right? Because f not x is x squared. Is x squared divided by x. So now f1 satisfies the constant against x uh, ma makes this, and therefore this supremum, finally, this supremum is, cert is certainly larger than what I obtained uh, f1 x divided by x, which is equal to x. Okay. So we have also the converse inequality. Hmm? Fine. Now, I think that uh, sooner or later we have to go to the proof of Ambanak. So we go. <laughs> and. Uh, So which is the situation of Ambanak? I don't rewrite here now the statement. It's a statement of set theory. But uh, we have uh, uh, the notation, however. So I think that we have some g subspace of a vector space. And we have a linear g, linear. And there is also something globally defined, which is p, OK? With the proper, so this is linear, this is almost a semi norm, but slightly less than a semi norm, you remember? So the capital G is subspace, capital E is a vector space, uh, small g is linear. Uh, this is sublinear and uh, one homogeneous, positively one homogeneous, just positively one homogeneous. And they are related by this, uh, uh, this, so G is dominated by P. And we want to find an extension of G in the wall space, a linear extension, uh, but, but still keep the difficult part is that you could produce several linear extensions, but the point is that to produce one which is below p everywhere. Okay, this is the point. Okay, now let us start by trying to. So, re obvious remark: if G coincides with D, e, there is nothing to do. Hmm? because we have already globally the linear G. So we can assume that this is not true. So we can assume this. And therefore, there is a point outside. So uh, let me uh, denote it by, I don't know, uh, x naught. Take x naught. Minus G. Okay, so X not is outside. So the first, the first point is now to extend, in some way, your linear functional to the span. So you you have G, and then you had X not. You take the linear span of G union X not. So the first point of the proof extend. Extend, extend G on the linear span of G union X naught. So we, for the moment, we do not pretend to extend uh, keeping 
linearly keeping uh, the the constraint the constraint Okay, so what do we do? We de define f, so any point in the linear spine, span of G union x naught can be uniquely written, so if x is in the linear span of G union x naught, then there is a unique way to write it as uh, lambda x naught, plus some element that I have denoted by, I don't know, uh, uh, doesn't matter. Uh, any, any element here can be written as x plus lambda x naught uniquely, okay? For some x in G and lambda real, okay? Any point, any element of can be written uniquely uh, as this for some x, for a, one x uh, in G and lambda in R. Okay. So, uh, so, so we have to define F on such kind of points. And of course we want it to be linear. Okay. So this we defined as F of x plus some number alpha uh, f of x naught, lambda, sorry, f of x naught, lambda uh, alpha, where now f is g. Hmm? So at the end, our definition will be this. And we have to find alpha, where alpha equal to f of x naught, of course, must be chosen, properly chosen. So I have capital G, x naught outside, this is the origin. Now I want to extend small g on the linear span of uh, g union x naught, but the point is that it's not clear that I can do this because, of course, this is a linear extension. But the point is to compute alpha so that uh, this is still true. Is it clear for the moment, the strategy? So the strategy, the, this is not, we are far from the, the end of the proof, but the strategy is first to extend at one point outside, hmm? keeping the constraint. So now claim, so, so we have to choose alpha. Uh, the point is to, to choose alpha. So properly, in, so that, uh, so that uh, f is less than p. Okay? This is the, the, the point. So now the claim is the following. We assume that we are able to assume that we prove the following two kinds of inequalities. So G of X plus alpha less than or equal than F of X plus X naught, P of X plus X naught, and G of X minus alpha larger or equal than P of X. Uh, sorry. Sorry, I changed the na letters, so uh, this I call x, but this I call in another way, so gy. 
So assume that uh, um, we prove, we are able to show, to find alpha such that for any x and g and y in g, so we, we find alpha, we are able to find alpha such that for any x and y in g, we have that, that inequality. Hmm? What do we want to prove? We want to show that this is less than p. Okay, our aim, we want to show, we want to show that g of x plus lambda alpha is less than or equal than p of x plus lambda x naught, okay? We want to show this. I claim that if we show this, then this follows. Huh? Is, it, is it clear? So I mean, uh, we want to find alpha so, so that this holds. Equivalently find alpha so that this holds, OK? Claim, if I prove that for any x in g and y in g I have this, then this holds. Hmm? So claim, assume, huh? then, then this for any x in g, and therefore, then this, and therefore, uh, we have our extension. Okay? So now I concentrate on this and try to show that this implies this, just by scaling argument. Okay? So there is no any more lambda here. This, is, this says essentially for lambda equal one and minus one is enough, essentially. Hmm? The idea is that do I have to show this, but essentially if I prove it for lambda equal one or minus one, then this is enough. This is the claim. Hmm? So uh, this is a scaling argument. So take lambda. I have, since our uh, p is just positively one homogeneous and not one homogeneous, so remember, our p satisfies this uh, lambda positive, etc. And th there is not the absolute value here and lambda real. It's just, the it's just this for lambda positive and, and, and no absolute value. So I have to distinguish lambda positive and lambda negative. <coughs> So take, for instance, lambda positive. And I want to show that uh, the first one of this implies this for lambda positive. Hmm? Okay, then I will show that for lambda negative, the second one implies this for lambda negative. So first take lambda positive and so we have that, so our assumption, let me write it here, uh, P of X plus X naught. So what do I do? I think I multiply, I consider X over lambda here. So I, I take uh, uh, one over lambda, so yes, X over lambda, so I have G of X over lambda, plus alpha, uh, this is less than or equal than p x over lambda plus x naught. Do you agree? Because I have this, right? So if I have this, 
G is a subspace, so I can consider in, in place of X just X over lambda, which is still an element of capital G. So I insert here, in place of X, X over lambda. And this is still true. Here, one over lambda goes outside because G is linear. Okay? Now I look at this. It's very similar, not exactly the same. So let me multiply. I want to show this. Huh? Almost the same, not exactly. So I just uh, multiply by lambda, which is positive. And the inequality remains. So I just have g of x plus lambda alpha less than or equal than lambda less than or equal than lambda p of x over lambda plus x naught. Okay? Well, now simply remember that our p is uh, positively one homogeneous. And lambda is positive here. So now by the, the property of positively one homogeneous of P, I just put lambda inside, and it immediately check that this is equal to P of X plus lambda X naught. Okay? So what I've shown is that the first of this, the first inequality implies what I want to show only for lambda positive. Now, I would prefer maybe to leave you as an exercise that the second one, homework, the second one implies this for lambda negative. Hmm? So, home. <coughs> I write down here the exercise. It's almost the same trick. Of course, now lambda is negative, so when you multiply by 1 over lambda, you have to reverse the inequalities. So there is some... Okay, so homework. Assume for any y in G, this is larger than P y minus x naught for any y in G. Then... G of X plus lambda alpha is less than or equal than P of X plus lambda X naught for any lambda negative. Okay, this is some work. <clears throat> so, using the homogeneity, we are reduced to the case lambda equal 1 and minus 1. Okay, we are, we are reduced to find alpha such that this is true. Now the point is, is there some alpha satisfy so that these two inequalities, families of inequalities, are true at the same time? So let us, let us try to rewrite this. So alpha must be at the same time. From this, Alpha must be less than or equal than this minus this, okay? P of x plus x naught minus g of x. But at the same time, alpha must be um, alpha must be. Is it correct what I've written? Yes. Ah, no, because I, I mean, sorry, sorry, sorry. Ah, no, because this is, this is wrong. Okay, sorry. So please correct this family of inequalities with less than or equal to. Okay? So at the same time, alpha must be less than this minus this, but also larger than this minus this. Okay? So at the same time, g of y minus p of y minus x naught. So, so if we want to prove the claim, 
we, want, we have to find alpha such that this is true for any x and y in G. We uh, need this for any x and y. Okay, do you agree? This is equivalent to this. Hmm? <clears throat> so there should be some separate, some number separating uh, these two. So let us rewrite it uh, in another way. So re observe now that uh, g of x plus g of y is equal to g of x plus y, which is less than or equal than p of x plus y, which is less than or equal than p of x plus x naught plus uh, p of y minus x naught. Hmm? Do we agree? So uh, let us repeat. Uh, we need to show that there is some alpha so that these two inequalities are true for any pair x and y in G. OK? Remark, G is linear. So take any two points x and y in G. G is linear. And uh, its domain is a linear space. So this is an ele element of the domain. So I can write this. This is clear. I also know by assumption that uh, g is less than p. So I have this. Now add them, subtract uh, y not, uh, x not, uh, x not. Use the uh, subadditive of p. Huh? So you have this. And therefore, so, so you have separately this. But this is, this is exactly this inequality. Namely, for any x and y, you surely know this. And therefore, you can put something in between by the properties of the real numbers. <laughs> is, 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 is this clear or not? It's OK? Proof? So, uh, so there is alpha. There is at least one alpha, which makes the job So what we have done up to now is that we have found the way to extend at one point, just one point outside, just in the linear span of just of what, using one point outside G. As you see it from the proof, the difficult part is to keep the constraint. The linear extension is easy, by, but keeping the constraint means to cleverly choose alpha. Otherwise, you don't have the constraint. OK? So this is just the first part of the proof, which is somehow constructive. And now there is the not constructive part to conclude the proof. So now you consider um, the, the, so now the, this is okay, let me consider now the family the, of course I have problems with the notation p p. Now consider the following set p. p is the set of all linear. H from their domain, its domain, linear subspace So now I consider an abstract object, the set of all linear maps, functionals, defined on a subspace 
subspaces, subspace, containing G, containing E, extending uh, such that H is equal to G on G, and keeping the constant, and uh, H less than or equal than P. Hmm? So what is this? This is a set of linear functionals, abstract. What we have proven up to now, what we have proven? That this is not empty. All the, all the effort that we have done up to now is just to show this. P is not empty. Huh? Why? Because F that we have constructed is an element of P. Huh? Because F is an element. Now the idea is to take the largest possible h. What, do, what does it mean, the largest possible h? h is a linear functional. What does it mean, the largest possible h? So now the candidate of our, of, our, of our theorem is to take the maximal extension, right? So the largest of all possible elements of p. Huh? And so this is an abstract problem of set theory, unfortunately. This is given by Zorn Lemma. But Lord Zorn Lemma says that there exists such a, a, a maximal element, uh, upper bound maybe, provided that P satisfies a special property. So take an element C. Con is a subset C contained in P, which has the following property, which is uh, um, totally ordered. Huh? Ah, which is the order on P? Right, I have to end all P with the, with, the, with the notion of order. So when I say that uh, H1, uh, the notation I think it's, it's H1 is less than or equal or contained. Let me, let me just check the notation, yes less than, let me just, let me just use this obvious notation. This is not bad because H1 and H2 are scalar valued. So maybe not bad to say. So I say that this is less than or equal than this if, well, if the domain of H1 is contained in the domain of H2, huh? And H1 extend H, H2. And H1, what does it mean H1 extends H2? Significa that they coincide. It means that they coincide in the smallest object. Huh? So H1 equal H2 on D of H1. It is an extension. OK? So in this way, I am comparing two elements of P. So inside, P is a big abstract set. And I'm saying, what does it mean that one is less than the other? Of course, not all elements of P can be compared to each other. We are not as in the real numbers that any real number can be compared with any other real number. This is not the case. You have an element here, an element here, in principle, they they are, one is not less than or equal than the other. I mean, so I cannot compare all elements one each other, but I can compare some maybe one some other, maybe. Hmm? So I am considering a big abstract set P, and I am endowing it with an order relation, partial order relation, partial in the sense that. I cannot compare, in principle, all elements one with each other. So 
I cannot say that I'm higher than you, but maybe I can say that I'm higher than you. Hmm? Or I, I mean, it's, it's a sort of a not higher, maybe is not the, be the, the best way to say, but well, if you, if you have, say, points with arrows, huh? you can order a finite set of points, for instance, with arrows, connecting with arrows. And you can say that one is larger of the other if there is an arrow in between the two with the proper uh, orientation. So, for instance, I can compare, say, this is less than this, for instance, but I cannot compare uh, this and this. So there is an order relation which says, okay, this is larger than this, okay? There is an arrow going from here to here with this orientation, okay? But then there is no arrow between this and this, so they, they are not related by the order. It's a it's sort of it's an object that is, okay? Uh, so we want, so the, the, the claim is that uh, Zorn lemma should give us the, be, the, 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 the largest possible extension, okay? But to apply Zorn lemma, there is an assumption. The assumption is that if you take C uh, totally ordered, ordered, then there is a maximal element of C. Huh? So you take a subchain, totally order of P, then there is a maximal element. Okay, uh, and then it is very easy to show that there, that, that there is the maximal element because if you have HI, so assume that C consists of HI for some strange set of indices, capital I, okay? So this is a family of linear maps in P. Hmm? E set of indices, I don't know how large it is. And uh, uh, HI is in P. And then how, how is naturally defined the maximal element of, of C? I take simply the union. So I, I simply take the following, H, so the domain of H, first of all. First, I, I, I isolate the domain of H. The domain of H is the union of, of all possible domains. Union of the domain of HI, okay? Now, I have not only to define the domain of H, but I define <coughs> H and h of x. How do I define it? Well, I take a point x inside here. This means that x is inside some of these, at least one. Hmm? And therefore, I define it uh, as so, x belongs to some hi, some dhi. So x in the union. Sorry. So P is non empty. Uh, P of H is this. Uh, we take a point X in the H. This implies that there exists an index such that X is in the HI. And then I try the following definition. I try the following definition, and I check that this definition is well, is, 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 a, is, well, is well, this is well defined because of the properties that this is totally ordered, so one is inside the other, and therefore there is no uh, ambiguity in defining this. It's well defined. for a totally ordered subset C in P. 
this is the uh, this is a um, maximal element of C, and therefore Zorn's lemma gives us the uh, what we want. So by Zorn. implies that there is an upper bound. Let me denote it by F, DF in R. Hmm? Now what we have to prove? Well, it remains to show uh, it remains to show this. The point is to show this. That F, the domain, is, is everything. is the ambient space. Uh? Well, and this is again true. Why it is true? If this is not true, then this is contained in this, and there is one point outside. But if there is one point outside, we know how to extend F outside by the previous step, the concrete previous step. And that is a proper extension of this, because now the domain contains strictly the F. And this contradicts the maximality of F. Huh? <laughs> so, uh, so this proof is interesting because it consists of two parts. There is one computational part in which you try to extend outside on the linear span of G and one point outside. OK, this is concrete. You find alpha, not, 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 not terrible, but not easy. Then there is this abstract part, which is somehow terrible, <laughs> because it's uh, terrible in the sense that it's, it's, it's not uh, constructive. There is this extension. You don't know very much about it, how to construct it. There is. But this extension, of course, is based on the previous step. So this, this proof, say, is divided into two. Hmm? As you can see, no continuity arguments, just set theory, in particular the last part. <clears throat> well, what would happen if we, we assume now just just remark a rough remark, eh? a little bit rough in the sense that I don't want to go into too many details into rough remark. Assume that E is something more, has a norm. It's not only a vector space. Now let me put it a norm. And assume even that, in addition, it is separable. Is it possible in this con under this condition to make a, a rather a, a proof less abstract than this? Huh? So why is this proof so di so difficult? Uh, because because we don't have structure, we don't have norm, we don't have separability. We just have a vector space. So when you have this, you have set theory. <laughs> no, uh, Yeah, the, the idea would be why? Why it is so difficult? But assume for the moment that, for instance, small l2, I mean, uh, separability is not always true. In l infinity, it's not true, but very often it is true. So why don't we assume? And uh, so, under this condition, what, what, what would be the natural way to do this proof? One way would be okay, take a point outside x0, 
uh, outside. Mm -hmm. And we know how to, so uh, let me denote it G1, say, uh, G1, the span of uh, what? Of G union X naught. And we know how to extend it, call this uh, G, small g1, maybe. So separable means that we have uh, x0, x1, etc., etc., countable number of points dense in E. Huh? Countable dense in E. Okay, take one of these points outside and extend it on the span as we have done before. But this extension, we can also keep the norm because under, under this uh, stronger condition, we have seen that we can keep also the norm. Okay, so the norm of G1 is equal to the norm of G. Okay, this, this is one of the remarks that we made yesterday. If we have a little bit more structure, eh, we, we have uh, this. Eh? So G is below the norm. G is below the norm. Now this is really a norm, it's not. And so we can make the norm preserving extension as in corollary one on G1, okay? Then the idea is to do on G2. So why don't we extend now on G2, which is the span of G1 union X2, two. Yeah, assume also this G continuous. Thank you. G is continuous. You have a bound using a norm. The constant is given by a norm, so small g is continuous. And we extend it into G1, into a continuous G1 on this. Now I, I do the same and extend it in span of G1 union X, X2. So I end up with a an, an continuous extension G2. And then I proceed by induction doing this on each GN plus one equal the span of GN union XN plus one. So this way, and I have the extension Gn plus one. Hmm. Now, uh, so we have a continuous function on this span, and then now the idea is now we have to globally define f. So, and the idea is now why don't we try to extend it by continuity? Extend it by continuity. So take x into E, take a sequence converging to x. So let me indicate it by xn sequence converges to x. Sequence of element of the dense subspace, so sub subset. So x is in the dense, uh, so xn in the, in the, uh, the notation maybe was D, I don't know, extend it to D, a dense subspace, sub, subset. So, and define f of x equal the limit of, uh, of what do we have, say, gn xn. Something like this. So this is, uh, so, uh, 
sorry, this is very rough. I don't want to enter in the details. I just, just a way to say that in order to make somehow a more uh, proof made by hand, assuming uh, norm space separability, maybe we can extend uh, on each point of the dense sub subset and then extend by continuity outside. Huh? And this is also this also works, I think. Works only the, uh, under these assumptions. So this is Professor, what about space? Yes. Ah, separable? Yes. I think that this works. In general, it is not. Never, uh, also in that case, you don't have uniqueness. But I think that in a separable Hilbert space, you can, uh, at least, I, I believe that this kind of more uh, concrete proof can be done by extending outside of the union of, say, so you have, essentially, you have defined uh, your, your, your F just only here, on the union of the GN. Huh? Because you proceed indu inductively with the countable induction. And so in the union of the GN, you have defined your F. Out this union is dense. And so at any point, text, you take an a sequence of elements here, Xn, and you, 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 you simply extend it by continuity. These linear functionals. And that works, I think, in Hilbert separable spaces. Yes. But that doesn't give you any uniqueness. You don't, I think that you don't have uniqueness even in finite dimension, by the way. There is no reason if you have a linear function defined on a line in R3. I think it's not. What if you want to, is if not non preserving, you have to preserve non? Yeah, you have to preserve non. The point is always to preserve non, of, co of course. Okay, well, uh, maybe we continue the discussion. Okay. <laughs>